All right. Hey, y'all, thanks so much for having me here in your San Francisco headquarters. I really appreciate the invitation, and I'm looking forward to our conversation about the change in buyer, supplier, trading partner dynamics, and the need for that change to happen now. Thank you for coming over. You, as a company, want to change a dynamic that has been years and decades and centuries in the making, and that is suppliers provide services and goods to buyers. They basically extend credit for a period of time until the buyer pays the bill, and that creates an outstanding receivable that our work together has quantified. We'll get to that in a minute. And that's the way business has been done. It's always been done like that. Buyers kind of like it for the obvious reason. Suppliers don't like it, but they've gotten used to it. Why do you think now is the time for a change? Oh, good question. So first, at the high level, I would say that you know, the sentence of, sentence of this is how things are being done and always been done, it's a trigger point for innovation. Right. It means that, okay, maybe it was because of technology issue, maybe because of some kind of a business habits or payment patterns, but we are in the 21st century and it's the edge of disruption or at least changing the way it have been done before. But more generally speaking, what has changed in the last decade is a just the availability of data and the richness mm -hmm. of data out there. Um, whether it's data on your business bank account that mm -hmm. is now accessible mm -hmm. through sets of APIs, whether it's your um, accounting software, invoicing software, ERP system, CRM system, inventory management system, it's all new data mm -hmm. that previously either didn't exist or was in some kind of a spreadsheet or even a paper. And now, not only this data exists, uh, there's a whole ecosystem of apps on top of that. Mm -hmm. So you go to a very granular level of app for inventory management in the restaurant supply chain space. So that's a very specific particular type of data that could get very granular and has a lot of insights on your business. And not only this data is there, it's accumulating very fast and accessible. Mm -hmm. So you have sets of API. Every company, even a startup today, has a sets of API. Some are private, some are public. But it means that the data can be connected to and used uh, relatively easily. And the third, yeah, technological trend, I would say, it's just recent developments in uh, machine learning, AI, data science, no matter how you call it, where you can pull all of this data in real time draw very accurate conclusions specifically about fraud risk and credit risk and mispayment risk and make almost seamlessly and immediate uh, decisions. So what it does is that allow, in this case, Funbox, but you know many other companies using it in different ways, to more of a streamline the experience of a B2B transaction. $1.7 trillion, we've estimated our work together doing a survey of small businesses suggests that at any moment in time, suppliers, small businesses, extend $1.7 trillion in credit to buyers, many of whom are much larger than they are. So there's definitely the need. There's definitely the appetite for, for doing it. But, but some argue, well, if there was only the certainty associated with knowing that net terms, which is what we've called this, the net term economy, um, was being, were, were being met, mm -hmm. that I was getting paid on the 30th or the 15th or the 17th, that I could plan my cash accordingly. Why isn't that good enough? B, I do agree that certainty has a, probably 50% of the role here. Mm -hmm. So it's combination of do I get paid? and when I get paid. Mm -hmm. And you know, our initial products, which are still pretty our biggest part of the, of the business, they're addressing that issue. However, it's only part of it. Um, the certainty would take you maybe a long way, but only so much, mm -hmm. because there's also the question of, do I have the cash to grow faster? Right, right. Or do I have the cash to pay for, I don't know, a uh, commitment I have? Because mm -hmm. I'm, something unique about B2B that doesn't exist in B2C, that almost every seller is also a buyer right, and right, vice versa. Right. 
So w what happens there is that, okay, let's say I have the certainty, I still need cash now. What inspired you to start the journey for mm -hmm. Funbox and, and, and specifically Funbox Pay, the, that evolution? One, just I have a personal uh, familiarity with B2B economy. So my mom used to own a small staffing business. Really? Yeah. And uh, her problem was that she had a bunch of fixed costs, which, you know, that's true for every business. It's insurance, headcount, right. taxes. Uh, space. Uh, space. Right. Yeah, that's a big one. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, every time you're getting a new purchase order in stuffing, it's slightly more nuanced. You have more out-of-pocket cash expenses. Mm -hmm. So the faster you grow, the less cash you have. Mm -hmm. You have more revenue, True. which is a good problem to have, but eventually you ran out of cash. And she had a revolving line of credit, but it wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. And eventually she just grew too fast to meet the payments. So on the paper, the business was doing very well, but in reality, it didn't have enough cash. The question was, why you're not getting paid earlier? Because you're staffing an employee, mm -hmm. they temp for three months, right. you're paying for them. And after those three months, you're getting paid from the company. Hmm. Um, so you need to survive for three months. Wow. And the answer was, oh, this is how things are being done. This right. is how the industry works. So I know the space, I know the dynamic. Um, and I didn't really think about it until many years later. When, when you think about the last decade of innovation in this space, and obviously your, your role in contributing to that innovation in the net terms economy, the, the, the B2B payment space, um, and, and now shifting your focus to the next decade, which we're not very far away from, yeah. from starting. What do you think that decade is going to be like with respect to buyers and suppliers embracing this n new way to pay and really getting on board, get, delivering additional momentum around what you've already achieved? So I don't know what it's going to be like. I know what it should be like. Uh, <laughs> well, let's start there. If you look at not the biggest innovation, I'm not talking electricity and internal combustion, right. but let's call it the 40s, 50s, 60s innovation. Uh, I would say the biggest driver was innovation in financial services. Mm -hmm. the, the credit card networks had an effect of you know, not only allowing the seller to get paid now, yep. so they had the cash now to hire more employees, yep. but it also provided credit for the buyer. Mm -hmm. So in a large degree, and I, I didn't research it, so that's my, my gut, um, a very large part of the growth from the 60s was driven by consumer sure. credit. Absolutely. And I don't know how much more steam it has to go. And the next wave of innovation, at least in financial services, should come from the B2B side. Mm -hmm. And the B2B side can, un, you know, almost order of magnitude larger, has the potential of unlocking much more value to yeah. the system and not only reallocate resources within existing players, but um, increase the size of the entire economic cake. And that's not our mission in life, but we believe we can help, you know, economies achieve that by making the B2B space more efficient on the side of the seller and the buyer. For a lot of these small businesses, they need help in thinking about change because... Not only for them. Um, I think for me as a consumer that mm -hmm. pretty much tech savvy, like it's, I'm still banking with the same bank yep. just because like the switching cost, I don't yeah, want to deal with it's, it. It's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. Um, I'm using pretty much the same stuff. People, I think there's so much information now flowing that you reaching a, a bandwidth or a psychological bandwidth saturation that you want to yeah. deal only with the most crucial things that you want to deal with. Absolutely. Otherwise, you're becoming either inefficient or crazy or both. Yeah. Yep. And that's even more true for business owners. Yep. Just because so much going on. It takes a human to run a business mm -hmm. and they're still acting like humans. Mm -hmm. So all the changes that would make sense eventually are imminent. Mm -hmm. You just not going to happen overnight. No, because change is hard. It goes back to how we started, which is it's always been this way. Status quo is a great trigger for making it not the same way going forward as it has been in the past. But, but there are still people who have to be convinced the change is better. And I think the one, the one common denominator for all businesses, particularly suppliers, is having access to cash. 
and the certainty of getting cash, getting paid to, to not only grow their business, but to keep their business running. Um, you know, for a lot of businesses, keeping their business on a steady state is really what they need to do and want to do. And growth is something that, of course, they aspire to, but, but paying the bills and keeping the, the lights on is important too. Agreed. And we want to take as much as we can out of that side of your business and just to automate it. So you don't have to think about it. Yep. You don't need to think about how much cash do I have? Did this guy pay me back? You know, does that business owe me money? Um, just automate everything that not relates to your core business. A lot of exciting times ahead. Oh yeah, I agree. Thank you, Al. Thank you. Great very conversation. Much. Thank you. I enjoyed it.